SMS Kronprinz Erzherzog Rudolf was one of the last Austro-Hungarian ironclads. The slightly smaller Kronprinzessin Erzherzogin Stephanie would be ordered later, but due in part to its smaller size, it would launch and commission earlier, making the Rudolf the last ironclad to actually come into service, as the next capital ship that would be built for the Kaiserlich und Königlich Kriegsmarine would be from the pre-Dreadnought era. And apologies to our Austrian and Hungarian listeners, I'll stop butchering that now. The Austro-Hungarian Navy had found itself in a bit of a quandary after the war with Italy in the 1860s, when they'd technically still been the Austrian Empire. Whilst the Battle of Lissa had been a resounding success, the war overall hadn't gone quite as well, and coastal territory had been lost. This diminished the importance of the Navy, and with the formal announcement of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the focus had turned inland. Since the increased voice of the Hungarian half of the empire was a lot more worried about the land borders, which were almost universally hostile. And so, in the end, only three further ironclads would be built. The Tegethof, which was a central battery ironclad, followed almost a decade later by the Rudolf and the Stephanie. They would be the last capital ships for another decade still. The Kronprinz displaced just over 7,000 tonnes, and made just under 16 knots on a nominal 6,000 horsepower, although a forced draft system would allow the two propellers to send the ship to just over the 16-knot threshold in emergencies. Although an ironclad by name, her hull frames and plates were actually made of steel, and she incorporated electrical generators and pumps of the latest designs. This all supported a weapons loadout that somewhat bridged the gap between the classic ironclad and the immediate precursor vessels to pre-dreadnoughts. The main battery consisted of three single 12-inch guns in open barbettes. Two were placed forward either side of the bridge, uh, leading to their underlying structure projecting significantly from the hull, with the third in a more conventional centerline position aft. This gave a broadside of only two guns, but it also allowed for a two-gun ahead salvo, and, oddly enough, a theoretical three-gun rear salvo if you weren't too attached to the structural integrity of the superstructure, or indeed the structural integrity of any crew who might happen to be above the deck at the time. Six 4.7-inch guns were mounted in a quite literal broadside array, three to a side, along with seven 47mm quick-firing anti-torpedo boat guns in a mix of calibres in the upper parts of the ship. Four smaller guns, mainly intended for landing parties, and the obligatory four underwater torpedo tubes, one in each direction, rounded out the armament. Unfortunately, her main guns were of an older type that was made just before quick-firing technology became common at larger calibres, and so her rate of fire was almost immediately behind ships that were launched even a year or so later. The ship's belt armour was 12 inches thick over the citadel and about 2.5 inches thick over the less important bits, accompanied by a nearly 4 inch thick deck. The rather visible barbettes had their own 10 inch thick protection. Now, whilst this might seem a little thin compared to the 18 to 24 inches that was found on ships that had been ordered a few years earlier in other nations, the Rudolf used the new compound armour instead of just iron, and so the difference in protection was not quite as great as a simple thickness comparison might suggest. She would be laid down at the start of 1884, launched in 1887 and commissioned in 1889. Unfortunately that took place just after the prince that she was named for had shot himself over an affair, which did kind of put a bit of a dampener on proceedings. But nonetheless, the ship entered service, and the next year, along with her half-sister and another cruiser, they took part in training exercises with the Imperial German Navy, stopping in various European ports on their way around the continent to join their erstwhile cousins, a tour that overall would seem to go down very well, despite the ship having some engine troubles. The pair would also represent the Austro-Hungarian Empire on a number of other ceremonial visits, but naval technology was advancing rapidly, and less than a decade after entering service, she was encountering ships twice her displacement, mounting fully turreted guns, and covered in steel armour. 
In short, she was obsolete. As a result, in the same year HMS Dreadnought was launched, she became a coastal defence ship and was still in this role when World War I broke out. An attempt to sell her, her half-sister, and the Tegethoff to Uruguay having not worked out in the interim. However, since she was unable to confront even the mostly pre-Dreadnought allied forces in the Adriatic, she remained in and around the port for the duration of the war, with nothing much exciting happening except for taking part in the Kataro Mutiny in 1918, which was quashed by the arrival of more modern battleships who were still loyal to the Emperor. With the end of the war and reparation negotiations ongoing, she was transferred, along with most of the Austro-Hungarian navy, to the new Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, and unlike many other ships, her transfer did actually stick, albeit for a relatively short time, as by this point she was so hopelessly out of date that she would be sent to the Breakers in 1922. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.